Jen Gerson. Hello. Um, hello. This one will be a quick one today, if only because I have another interview I need to do later today. And then I'm also having my house taken over by tweens. Oh, um, God. For a, a sleepover birthday party. Why would you do that to yourself? Um, it, it was requested and we agreed. Plus, you know what's funny? Hockey season's begun for my son. So like two weeks ago, I was saying to friends, man, it's been really quiet around here for the last couple of weeks. Not not this week this week well i gotta say is you love your children more than i do although i have taken one for the team for my children i am on my second consecutive strep infection yeah. and the doctors are now saying you know if you you know adults aren't actually supposed to get strep infections at all just so you know so if you're you, if you get like the magic number three you maybe want to start talking to your doctor about a tonsillectomy and i'm like yes that's exactly what i need as a 38 year old woman the two sickest, weeks off is the sickest i've ever been in as an adult was a strep infection my daughter brought home when she was an infant from uh, uh. Daycare. and i thought it was a cold i took over the counter cold meds and i got up a couple of days after it began and i face planted on the floor of my bed because my balance yeah. was off so i got yeah. out of bed and then my body just kept going and then bam yeah. literal face plant um, and it took me three weeks to shake that because it turns out you can't ignore strep infection. They no. don't go away on their own. No, they don't. And I, but I know people who have actually wound up like young, healthy people who wound up in hospital near death with strep infections. Like my, they're, they're, they can get very nasty if you're not. My careful. doctor shamed my immune system. He said he was going to extend my antibiotics around. Like I was like not getting worse, but I was not getting better. And my mm -hmm. doctor increased my um, amoxicillin or whatever it was. And he said, if this doesn't work by Monday, I'm putting you in a hospital hospital and IV antibiotics. And I think my immune system suitably shamed, rallied and moved on. Yes, well, um, I'm, on, I'm now I'm now on the uh, I mean, I'm not super sick or anything because I've been taking antibiotics again. But I'm now on like the one step up from the antibiotics I took before that didn't work. Uh, so yeah. yay um, for me. Um, let's talk news. And again, we'll do this in about a relatively tight time for by our standards today. Um, public or, uh, public order emergency committee getting underway in Ottawa. And we... purely uh, as a matter of procedure, this is going to have to be a pretty aggressive deadline for them. Um, the legislation, the Emergencies Act, requires a report on the circumstances surrounding it within 12 months of the emergency being invoked. And uh, the, the judge who's chairing this, Commissioner Rouleau, had a, had a medical emergency of some kind. And the, the uh, procedure was, um, sorry, not the procedure. The procedure was immediate. The inquiry was delayed. So they're on a pretty aggressive schedule here. I've been talking to some of my Ottawa friends about this. They might have to run six frantic weeks of testimony to give the commission time to then write up the report. Um, I don't know if I have any, like sizzling wisdom to offer uh, Wait, first, ask, is this the is this going to be the inquiry that decides whether or not um the uh, circumstances justified legally justified i mean um, um I, I don't calling. know if decide is the right term but yeah like this is the one that looks at that and like yeah, I, okay. I don't know if like a verdict is given at the end like and we have determined that like you know and then like this yeah. dramatic pause but this is the one that will be looking into that like i don't know what happens if if justice reload decides it wasn't See, like that this is and this is the point that i figure whenever this stuff comes up i feel like i want to make this point again and again and again and then i remember that i'm not supposed to be on twitter anymore because it's bad for me and that is no one is disputing that the event was difficult for the residents of ottawa that that is beyond dispute what we're trying to determine here is whether or not very specific legal thresholds were met that justified calling the emergencies act yeah like that is that is the question here which was an extraordinary act and 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 and, and by this definition calling an emergencies act is a, is a significant overreach by the federal government as it sometimes ought to be so there are very narrow definitions by which it is appropriate to do this and did this particular circumstance meet those narrow legal definitions yep. this yep. is not a debate about whether or not the honking kept you up at night or prevented you from getting to your cancer treatments or whatever like we are all on on board we've all established that this was a serious inconvenience to the people of ottawa a, a significant one that is beyond dispute but that is not what we're actually litigating here so whenever i see anybody uh, fall back into covering this particular um, committee or a particular uh, inquiry by focusing on how bad this was 
for you know joe blow Ot- uh, ottawa i'm kind of like that's not the point like like no offense to joe blow ottawa but that's really not the point of this you and i have been pretty consistent in that and i honestly I, a couple of weeks ago i was um when this when i knew this was getting started i went back and i reread our coverage i did my three dispatches from ottawa and then i had some follow-on pieces kind of uh, continuing to process that you went to coots on the border you wrote about that and i also read our dispatches where we'd been discussing this and i i mean hey when we get it wrong we get it wrong but when we get it right we get it right and i think we were very laser focused on that exact issue last year yeah you and i were fully on board with we got a big problem here we are deep in the shit but was it necessary to invoke the emergencies act and i know that people i look i think you said it right was it and was it legal to invoke the emergency as the actor was this a political or was this an inappropriate invocation uh for political reasons that's the danger and this is something you and i were writing about at the time which is that having been a bit asleep at the switch originally having been embarrassed publicly uh by the fact that uh that the capital had been lost (laughs) and especially after the americans began leaning on us about the border closures there was and people like this will piss people off but we're just going to be honest here there was a political reason to make the big splashy move of invoking the emergencies act it sent a message to uh ottawans it sent a message to canadians in general and sent a message to our allies okay we're we're engaged with this here and you know in a weird but the, way po- but the but a political justification doesn't isn't a legal one well here, here's a problem. fun nuance i actually wrote about this in one of our dispatches but this was many many months ago what if the what if the emergency we were responding to with the emergencies act was not the border blockades was not the ottawa occupation it was the collapse in confidence in canadian state capacity among our allies like, and if they wanted to make that argument, I'm they, open to which that. Which they don't. No, but, I, but, that's, but that's but the problem is that if you want to make that argument, you need to openly make that argument. Which they will not right? do. And that which could, I actually would 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 probably would probably have a better chance of succeeding under the legal definitions of the Emergency Act than anything that they're going to try. It's so. an it's an inch. It's like I know it. Like it's a little bit of legalese and wordplay to even think about it that way. But you know when some of the coverage came out after the crisis that like Ottawa was quite rattled when uh, the white house began to lean on them. And it occurred to me then, what if that was the emergency? Like, what if, what if the only problem that could not be solved by all the usual laws of Canada as spelled out in the act was telling the Americans in particular, that we were still a reliable partner, which is pretty grim. Yeah. The only, a a couple of other just side points I would make. Um, I like the fact that the testimony started with residents of Ottawa. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, once this became political, Mm -hmm. we did get a bit detached from the fact that there were people living in the middle of this. So I thought that was... I think that that that's a a sheer propaganda play. I know, but it doesn't mean I can't like it. Uh Like, I... Fine. I thought it was, like, I I, I saw what they were doing, and I was like, oh, okay, that's that's clever. The other point I would make, though, is that one of the things that... but But it's obfuscating the point. A single Ottawa resident being uh, even terribly inconvenienced and 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 horrendously, you know, persecuted by these 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 this convoy isn't the point. Like it's just it's it's just about creating a sob story narrative in order to justify what has a very specific legal definition. And it, to me, it indicates if that's what they're starting out with, that's what the prosecution's starting out with, yeah, or if that's what it. the defense of the government is starting out with. It oh, indicates to me that they don't actually have a legal a legal justification for invoking the Emergencies Act. So they're they're going to they're going to just play the the PR angle on this. Maybe I'm more cynical than you are, but I agree with every word of that. But that's almost why I liked it. I was like, oh, I see what you're doing. Like I've been writing about politics for 15 years. Occasionally, I might get enamored of the politics. Um, one of the things, though, and this is related to this, you know what's not coming up much? Borders. Hmm. Because, you know, when I think back to February, Ottawa was a real problem. Like, it was a real problem because it was also publicly revealing how inept we were, which is bad for a lot of reasons. Yeah. But the borders were the actual crisis. And I, I, I yeah. have a column here at the line that says that, like, right in the headline, the borders are the crisis. And yeah. It, it seems like that will be, relatively speaking, a fairly small amount of what's um, what's covered uh, dur- during the. the and to me, that just it just it just breeds of uh, misdirection. 
I think from the very beginning, it has not been hard to see the liberals attempting to steer this thing in the preferred direction. Where fair enough, I guess. But... I mean, from from the very outset, when they were like, "We've invoked the Emergencies Act, and then we will have a commission to investigate how this, you know, this convoy." And people, including me, right away were going, eh, "That's not what the commission does." The commission's purpose is not per se to investigate the circumstance of the emergency so much as it is to examine the federal response. Yes. And I I hope Commissioner Rouleau is uh, on the ball on that front. Um, in terms of other comments to make, here's my closing comment on this. And it, it echoes what you said at the beginning, but I think it cuts both ways. I still think the broader public has a wrong understanding of what happened in February. And when I went to Ottawa, I, I told you this directly when I was going there. And also I wrote this in the first piece. I went there explicitly because I had no faith in the narratives I was reading from any source. Mm -hmm. And I, my experience in Ottawa and my analysis of Ottawa was that there were two different crises unfolding in parallel there there was a hard, dangerous, anti-government faction there, but it was kind of enveloped by a spontaneous, annoying, but probably legal-ish grassroots movement. Like, yeah. to the extent that the, the rest of the convoy people were breaking the law, they were breaking the law probably relatively in the range of which other protests disrupt life and break the law, except yeah. it was longer which it shouldn't have been allowed to be. Um, and I, I still think, and I said this at the very beginning, people are going to be cute and they're going to either, because it suits their agenda and their purposes, they're going to look at the hard right thing and go, that was the convoy, or they're going to look at the bouncy castles and they're going to go, it was a harmless protest. We're still, we're still trying to, um, we're having a conversation about the convoy, but we as a country are talking about two different things and we're pretending the other guy's talking about the same thing. Well, and, and that, that's also not help. I mean, this is why it bothers me that they're starting with annoyed Ottawa residents and they're not starting with the evidence that there was a hard right faction there that had the potential to cause serious violence, which would legally justify calling the act. Possibly. Uh, you know, but, but, so far, but so far, I mean, nobody's come forward with any real solid evidence that those people were there. I mean, there's your perception, and I'm not discounting your perception. Oh, no, I agree with you. Like, but like, like what, the evidence where, is all classified. Where's the evidence from the government saying, look, we needed to call the Emergencies Act because there was this hard faction of people? Like, I would expect that information to have come out by now. I, I, if it comes out at all, it's going to come out in camera and it's going to be classified. Which, so... is, which is insane. And that's, and that's where this whole thing goes off the rails for me because a real true review of what happened has to include a public accounting for the, the actual decision-making that went well, on there. Something else we were so quick on in February was to realize that the way the Emergencies Act is construed, and particularly, if I may, the way these liberals will use the Emergencies Act and the legislation around it, only cabinet is capable of declaring whether cabinet was justified. And that's a problem. And I don't know how we fix it. I, I honestly don't. Maybe there needs to be some third party, like an officer of parliament who basically exists to call bullshit on this stuff. I don't know how we would do that. But it, given the power and the breadth of cabinet confidence, only the cabinet is able to pass judgment on cabinet's decision making and actions. And that's a problem. Yeah. So, all right. Tell me about Alberta. Uh, speaking of problems, uh, Daniel Smith. A, great a really first interesting, week on the job. Great first week. Super. Um, so, I mean, I will give some Dan Smith some credit for this. You know, she has actually been very accessible and very open. Um, so, you know, after she's sworn in, she had an hour long press conference, uh, which is not something that almost any politician does nowadays. And she went over, like, she took every question. She answered quite, quite openly. Of course, the one thing that took people took away from that hour long press conference was the part where she said that the vaccinated had been one of the most discriminated against groups in her lifetime, which prompted her to do a follow-up uh, uh, um, release clarifying her remarks, saying, look, we're not trying to create false equivalencies. You know the gif of the blinking guy? You're like, 
that was my reaction to the unvaccinated or the most yeah. discriminated against people in history. Yeah. I actually think there are some cases where the restrictions against the unvaxxed either went too far or persisted yeah. too long. Yep. But go to a fly-in reserve with no clean water and yeah. explain to them that you're the most oppressed person in this country. Yeah. And like, also, like, this, please is, do. This, this is a classic example also where stuff that got um, massive applause for Smith on her stump uh, does not translate to ordinary speak. No, it's more uh, simple than that, Jen. This is echo chamber. Like this oh, yeah, is the, nothing correct. more yes, complicated you're right, than you're the right. echo chamber. I think we're saying the same thing, essentially. But, but yeah, essentially, I heard this shit on the stump all the time. She she repeated this multiple times and it always got a really brave review. Um, so it, clearly this particular line and this particular line of thought um, has has fermented within a particular echo chamber and then it was revealed to the world and everybody was like, huh, what? What are you talking about? Um, I mean, she, she's promised numerous times to that she's going to make, you know, your vaccination status a, a matter of human rights law. Um, so you can't be discriminated against as a result of it. I mean, that's, that's banana cracker stuff, right? But again, on the stump, did really well among her, among her supporters. So there was that. Uh, she's promised to fire Dina Hinshaw, which makes me feel sad inside because Dina Hinshaw has been turned from, you know, iconic heroine of the COVID effort to most reviled woman in the province by left and right. And to fire her, I mean, you know, she made errors. Of course, everybody did. But to fire her and scapegoat her, um, again, this this is this is playing to echo chamber stuff. And it, it's not a reflection of, of, of Dina Hinshaw's genuine integrity, which she has. And, uh, oh, yeah, then something else happened. Oh, she's gonna fire uh, the Alberta Health Board services and replace them with like a like a like an ombuds person. She so, she so she's actually following through on everything she said she was gonna do on her stuff, is what I'm hearing. There is gonna be a there's been a a, a slight pivot on some of the sovereignty act stuff. Um, what was I think that Anderson, slight? No, it was no no no. She's always said that her sovereignty act would be within the within the boundaries of the Canadian Constitution, which always prompted the the uh, response. Well, then what the fuck is the point? <laughs> if it's within the boundaries of the Canadian Constitution, then you don't need a sovereignty act to do it. Mm. And I mean, maybe here's where I can get into the fact that, you know, on the stump, she was um she was justifying her sovereignty act by noting that Alberta's choice to not enforce the uh, 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 gun the RCMP gun, gun buyback mm -hmm. was a classic example of just how justified she was going to be by bringing in the sovereignty act. And the right really not needed. The one that that clearly wasn't needed in order to do this happening. because it's already happening. Can I um, also I'm... bluntly I'm... like like uh, uh, well criminal law is that or sorry not criminal but this is criminal law is kind of one of those areas of kind of joint responsibility because provincial policing is a provincial um, uh, priority. So this is actually one of those areas where provinces have always had a little bit of leeway to say, okay, hey, that's nice, but we're not going to focus priorities toward that. Or sorry, we're not going to focus resources toward a federal government's particular priority, as BC did with um, uh, pot dispensaries. I think I mentioned that in the last week's dispatch. So I don't know what to tell you, man. Um, what's interesting to me is 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 who Danielle is surrounding herself by. Her top person in all of this is Rob Anderson, who goes back in Alberta politics to Wild Rose days. Oh, even way out here in the center of the universe, we know that name. We know that name. Um Rob Anderson is also, you know, the guy who penned the Free Alberta, you know, borderline secessionist propaganda that 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 uh, Smith played fealty to. They have a long-standing sort of weird codependent relationship. The fact that she's now in he he's now in the premier's office tells me that the echo chamber that she is surrounding herself with is is intense, loud, and impenetrable. Um, so to me, that's not a great sign. So, uh, first week on the job, um, bit wild and crazy. We're going to see what she does next. Salper to the show. It's going to be a full-time beat for me for a while. So people have mentioned to me, so like, like, I don't know what, what from Alberta, from center of the universe, uh, land, what, what that I just said is most interesting to you? Um, all of it, which is not me just oh. being flattering, although you are beautiful, but no, there <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how to write your Alberta blur, but listening to you as a non-Alberta guy, there actually is a through line through all of that. Okay. I'm going to give it to you in one sentence. Danielle Smith steps out of the echo chamber. 
Okay. Yeah. The the, the yep. common theme in all of that was all the stuff she's been talking about for not only months on the leadership trail, but probably years as yep. radio host, columnist, commentator at her own website. Well, now she like she has left the controlled environment of either media commentary or leadership yeah. aspirations and now yeah. she's in into reality where the supreme court of canada still exists we yeah. have a constitution yep. where there are in fact a people who've been oppressed more than people who had to show their vaccine barcode uh, yeah yeah and but like and all of this is basically the transition no pun intended from right-wing alberta echo chamber passing through the bubble and then boom you're back in the real world where well, reality and, has sway and this is this is the other thing too it's like i think that there's a temptation among people who are in the right wing alberta echo chamber to think that their echo chamber is reflective of alberta as, as as a whole and if you fall into that trap you are going to get eaten every time because alberta right wing echo chamber is a space it's a very influential space in alberta understandably but it is not where most of alberta lives um it's just perhaps the loudest well, of 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 the of the respective interests so it's it's a yeah far yeah. be it for me to go out and, and defend the far right echo chamber here but can i just make the point that th this is this is a, sh a sin shared equally among echo chambers oh, absolutely whatever your absolutely echo chamber is, is it has yeah, yeah. the same effect on warping your perception of reality yeah it's like this is this uh my echo chamber says this so therefore I'm, i've got my beat on the pulse sort of thing and it's no you don't <laughs> one of the things and i was talking to some friends about this earlier in the week is trying to understand in a, in a sense of the not not conservatism as an electoral force but conservatism as a movement when it went nuts and one of the i mean there's a lot of ways of looking at this and i i do think this is not a particular specifically right-wing phenomena but i think what has happened is the 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 progressive or the left-wing echo chamber in a lot of ways and you know me i'm not a reflexive media basher for obvious reasons but those conversations played out in the forums of the legacy media or mm. the downtown cocktail circuit events and you know you, you send the national post editorial board to a walrus foundation dinner and we're the we were the weirdos right like you know what i mean mm -hmm. what has happened now is that there is this fully functional thriving alternative right wing echo chamber and the two of them are colliding like matter and antimatter and that's mm -hmm. causing a lot of societal disruption I'm not trying to draw moral equivalency here, but I, I do think it is remarkable to me how often I have to explain to people who fully understand the danger of sort of the, the, the Fox News right wing information ecosystem, who genuinely do not realize that they exist inside a white collar urban Canadian media ecosystem. Yep. And it's like they can see it so plainly when they when those other bastards are doing it. And have no idea that they're in their own bubble. And I'm not drawing moral equivalency between the bubbles. I am saying if you're in a bubble, you should know it. Yep. And you and I are in bubbles. Yep. And we know it. And we have, as best we can, developed feedback mechanisms to save us from ourselves. Not, not always successfully. No, I was about to say, not always successfully. But we're aware of it. And we are constantly, I mean, I spend more time than I can tell you talking to pollsters, trying to gut check my instincts. Mm. Is this thing that I think is a problem actually a problem? Is this thing that I don't think is a problem? Maybe it is like, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Polls are not a perfect proxy. I have friends I'll talk to to be like, Hey, is anyone in your circle talking about this? Mm -hmm. Like an example, we, we won't spend much time on this. The Hockey Canada scandal, the um, uh, the CEO and the board stepping down this week because of the fallout of the, the sexual misconduct. That was an issue I was actually hearing in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, especially as I mentioned, my son's hockey's back. So we're at the rink, we're, we're, we're having team meetings. This is like real human beings off of social media are talking about this. You have to have those checks to your, yeah. To, you, yeah. like you have to, you have to put pokes, you got to poke some holes in your own filters so that some of the sunlight can get through. Yep. And uh, everything you're describing, I think, I think the theme for Danielle Smith is stepping out of the echo chamber and back into reality. Well, and also the degree to which she, she's not, she is in her echo chamber. 
she thinks the problem with her with her government here is that like it's not rural enough really alberta the ucp needs to really get back to its rural roots and put get 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 so many of those out of calgary out of calgarians out of out of cabinet that's too many city folk well reality has a way of it's having its way in the end yeah it's like well except the problem is that you're quite right danielle that you know the ucp has no hope if it can't if it can't start with a rural base but it also has no hope if it if it can't maintain calgary and a significant portion yeah. of it Edmonton's lost to you. That's why Calgary had a disproportionate power within the UCP cabinet room. I was looking at an electoral map of Alberta a few days ago. This is how I party. Um, it seems to me that the, the UCP, to your point of last week, actually has a, don't count it out yet. Like it, it has some oh, God, no, stuff I, going I, in its favor. I, I, I go into the next election 50-50 odds. If the NDP are going to win, they're going to win in Calgary. Like that's that's and the... and I'll tell you I I talk to my neighbors and I'm in a very conservative part of suburban Calgary, um, but I talk to my neighbors and they're just like, I I can't vote for Danielle. Like, what do you like? All right, my... Calgary, uh, Alberta, explain this to me. Okay. Is Calgary in the context of electoral politics for Alberta what the 905 is for federal electoral? Yes, politics? yes, that's a, that that's an excellent way. Like that's a good when analogy. it swings. Yeah. The, the government changes yes it it does but uh in this case but it, it's not as a um it's not as a sin calgary sort of is is inherently a slightly more conservative place than well, yeah, yeah yeah no i understand but i mean like, but you yes. have to win it to change the suburb government. the suburbs of calgary where i live the suburbs of calgary are where you're going to win a winner lose a government okay yeah. so most of the canadian federal electoral map is fairly predictable but if there's a big change to the 905 you'll end up with a conservative or a liberal yeah that's in right. the same and, way in a Alberta yeah. suburbs will I think, uh, Calgary I think suburbs. They, yeah. And and the the number of people who are diehard conservatives, Mormon, like we're talking really conservative people who are looking at this government going, mm. you know, se sex separation doesn't benefit us. Like that's what are you talking about? Like what planet are you on? All right. Um, the only so we're we're gonna do as we always do. We're gonna put an appeal out to some of our buddies and and see if any of them want to uh, chip in a blurb or two. But I do want to write one more blurb, and I I need to do more research on this. So I'm being honest with you now. I don't have all the information, but uh, I I hesitate to do this because I know it's gonna ruin our our emails and our Twitter mentions. But I want to talk about Elon Musk. Oh, and um, I you know I yeah I think you're right. About what that's gonna ruin our mentions. No, that we should talk about Elon Musk. Screw the Twitter people. So Elon Musk has provided Starlink sets, thousands of them. Starlink is a uh, satellite-based internet connectivity platform. They're small, they're portable, and they have relatively low uh, energy costs. So what this means is that you can use them in the field. And Starlink has allowed the Ukrainians uh, to maintain battlefield connectivity. It has been a major military edge that they've had over the Russians. Mm -hmm. Elon has been speaking increasingly stridently that he wants to see this conflict end, that he's concerned about escalation to nuclear war. And I can't say for certain, but it is my opinion that Elon is high IQ, low EQ, mm -hmm. and he has been spun effectively yep. by someone sympathetic to Moscow. Yep. And there have there are now growing signs, and this is where I want to do my research. I don't have all the information here yet that Musk is using Starlink as a lever to pressure the Ukrainians, or at least to limit where they're capable of operating militarily. Mm -hmm. That's speculative. Give me some time to firm that up. I think Elon Musk is a very, very good businessman. And I know he's controversial, but I really, in general, like what he's doing. I support, in general, what he's doing with EVs, with Space Launch, and with Starlink. But I think he fucked up. And I think he fucked up in a big way. Because he has just reminded not only the Ukrainians, but every allied government that you cannot rely on private sector corporations to form the backbone of national security or military communications. That's right. Because you can never be on the battlefield winning. And then a nervous CEO puts limits on your military aims. Yep. Yep. And God bless Elon Musk for having donated those kits in the first place uh, and, and donating some of the bandwidth as well. This has been massively helpful to Ukraine and Ukraine might have lost the war already if not for them. So I'm not taking any way, anything away from the Musk's original uh, donation here. 
but I believe he has overplayed his hand in a way he may come to regret because this yep. is a stark reminder. Some some national capabilities, including what what our military friends would call signals, you have got to have those in house. So okay, you Elon Musk has shown the world the power of satellite based internet constellations, and has also shown the necessity of having some of them under allied military direct government control. Well, I keep on going back. I mean, when you say that, I go back to remember when uh, I wrote about this when during, uh, what again, Daniel Smith's stump speech where she's like, we're going to create a, Alberta into a free speech zone oh, yeah. and we're going to reach out to Elon Musk to like uh, facilitate, you know, uh, internet service providers to this free speech zone of Alberta. And I was like, and you know, we dissected that already, but I just keep on thinking, wouldn't we make a little argument today now, would you? Yeah. Well, all right, so those are so I'll do um, uh, emergency commission and I'll do Elon. Okay, you will I will do, do Alberta the show. Yeah, like Smith steps out of the echo chamber. Yeah, um, I think that's a good that's a good through line. I like it. It, it just links all of them. Like, You're right. Every story we talk about today, yep. they're all some version of Smith being like, "Whoa, I'm not campaigning anymore." Uh, and we'll poke around with some of our buddies and we'll see if anyone else wants to write anything. But that's <laughs> that's all I got. Okay, cool, awesome. Uh, so Thanks, as usual, everybody. video podcast Friday and written dispatch Saturday. Uh, yeah, let's do it. All okay. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks everybody.